All right, eye problems that are not emergencies. So presbyopia is a term that you got to know what normal age-related changes are, and presbyopia is just that. Um, so just with age, people lose lens elasticity, and the key to diagnosing this on the exam is somebody who has normal vision acuity on testing, but they tell you that when they try to read, they have to hold objects further away from their eyes to see the letters. So these people get reading glasses. So just know what this is. Uh, the macular degeneration is, uh, you know, potentially testable. Um, and this is the, you know, the most common cause of vision loss in elderly people. And you remember it's the Drusen deposits, but uh, on an eye exam, it's central vision loss. And if they give you a picture of the visual fields, because they can do that, they would have complete darkness just of the middle of their visual field. Central scotoma, as it's called. Uh, smoking is a risk factor, and if somebody presents with early macular de degeneration, the next best step in management may be to tell them to stop smoking. So on your, your eye exam, you can do what's called the grid line test. You hold up a little object with moving straight lines, and for whatever reason, in macular degeneration, these people see ribbons or the lines look curvy to them instead of looking straight. So distortion of straight lines is sort of pathognomonic, at least on your shelf, for macular degeneration. Now, if somebody presents with uh, MD and they are going blind uh, over the course of a couple of months, you should assume that it's wet macular degeneration. Just like most of our chronic eye issues, this is due to angiogenesis and new blood vessel formation, blood vessel formation that are, you know, they're not well made, and they're prone to leaking, and they, uh, you know, they're not good. Okay, uh, and I think that's just what I would bear in mind is that they may not tell you uh, enough information to really decide if it's dry versus wet. Your best clue might be someone who, over the course of less than a year, has gone from decent vision to almost blind. And this is just a picture of what the uh, exam can look like. If you're lucky enough to have a picture, then that, you know, those little splotchy areas around the macula are what you might see. So with diabetic retinopathy, uh, what are we dealing with here? Progressive changes, obviously, but the hyalinosis and thickening where you, you know, are basically causing ischemia leads to cotton wool spots. So that helps me remember that you have little pale areas, just like with, you know, the more serious central artery occlusion. This is a much more minute version of that causing little areas that aren't getting enough blood and turn pale. Then... Just like with the kidney disease, with diabetes, they lose the basement membrane and the vessels are prone to leaking and they're also weaker, so they form aneurysms, but due to their leakage, you can see little blot hemorrhages. Uh, and then neovascularization is the long-term complica complication. And the problem here is that these vessels that they form are not good, they're, they leak, and usually when they form, that's when you start people, start seeing people who have uh, vitreous hemorrhage as a complication or traction on the retina, which could lead to a retinal detachment. So what do we do? Uh, let's see here. So this is just sort of tells you what you see. So the key to proliferative diabetic retinopathy is neovascularization, all right? And all the other complications, the wool spots and the aneurysms and the hemorrhages are non-proliferative. And this is important. I want you to take this home with you, okay? Macular edema. When they tell you that somebody with diabetes is having blurry vision, decreased visual acuity, trouble seeing things, the cause of that is going to be macular edema. And all the stuff we talked about here contributes to macular edema, okay? So that is the key. They say, what is the cause of vision loss in a diabetic patient? You say macular edema. And these are just some pictures helping you. There's your little cotton wool spots, those little punched out clear lesions there. And then you have all those little uh, circular areas of hemorrhage, the little blot hemorrhages. So I, I think to me, once you've seen this, it can help you remember it going forward. Um, and that's pretty unique. And here is a case with angiogenesis and proliferative retinopathy and those beefy blood vessels coming out of there. I mean, my goodness. I mean, the pictures can be pretty dramatic for this stuff. I mean, that's not that's not something that I want to, you know, take out to dinner or anything, you know what I'm saying? And then you look down here, and you have these deposits of, of exudate due to the new fragile vessels leaking, you know, just crap all in here. So 
the angiogenesis contributes much more quickly to the development of macular edema because all these these deposits here this is not necessarily infarction but more so you know deposits of you know stuff that leaked out of the blood vessels and so how do we manage it you need to know the screening and the screening is easy because it's the same as the screening for nephropathy and neuropathy you screen at the time of diagnosis if they're type 2 diabetic so 35 40 whatever if I diagnosed you today, we're going to screen you, which means I refer you to the eye optometrist. Okay, uh, And if they're type 1 diabetic, then three to five years after diagnosis, they should be screened for retinopathy. So uh, if it's non-proliferative, then the management is going to be conservative. We're just going to try and control their sugars, and we're going to control their blood pressure. And anytime we talk about blood pressure control in a diabetic patient, you should think about an ACE inhibitor. And if they do have proliferative diabetic retinopathy and they happen to ask you what the treatment for that is it is retinal photocoagulation to the entire retina and be aware again vitreous hemorrhage somebody who has diabetes uh, and uh, they probably have proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy and that allows the fragile blood vessels can essentially just leak or hemorrhage and they have symptoms that are exactly the same to uh, retinal detachment and the treatment for this is going to be upright positioning and just letting it resorb. But over time, if there's enough of these vitreous hemorrhages, you know, it could require, you know, ophthalmologic management. So now open angle glaucoma, this is the non-emergent glaucoma. And I wanted to show you a picture of it because here's a normal optic disc right there, small little, uh, you know, light colored area. And then here is open angle glaucoma. You've got that massive opening or cup there, and they call that, of course, cupping. Uh, so now you know what opening a glaucoma looks like. Hopefully they give you a picture of it and you have solved the question. Uh, so you should know that this is actually a, an optic neuropathy of the optic nerve. Uh, and these people, just like people with acute angle closure glaucoma, they also have elevated intraocular pressures. The difference is they're not as high and it's a chronic elevation. And the problem with these patients is that they have slowly progressive peripheral vision loss, but they don't realize it. So, you know, they're developing tunnel vision, but to them, they have no real change in their vision. So the thing is, people who we think are at risk for glaucoma need to be screened for it. And really, what I got from the internet is that anyone who's age 40, your PCP, or you as the PCP on the exam, should refer them to an optometrist to have screening done to rule out glaucoma. They do that by measuring the IOP with tocometry, and they look in the eye to see if there's cupping of the optic disc. And just be aware of the risk factors. Older age is a risk factor. Uh, uh, being black is a risk factor. And a family history would be a risk factor just like for everything else. So then optic neuritis is a, a good one to talk about because it usually happens in MS patients and on your shelf. If you have this, it's usually going to be the presentation for multiple sclerosis. And when I hear optic neuritis, the, the thing that sticks out to me about it is they have acute uh, change in their vision with pain, but also loss of color perception, classically described as they can't see the color red. So you hold up something red and they, you know, they can't see it. They, it looks white to them. That is very, very unique to optic neuritis. Uh, and the afferent pupillary defect. So you shine the light in the patient's eye and instead of dilating, uh, or I'm sorry, instead, <laughs> instead of constricting as it should, the pupil dilates. So that's the afferent pupillary defect, all right? Uh, and that should help you just be able to recognize optic neuritis. Then with C and B retinitis, I just wanna throw this in here for you. You have somebody with severe AIDS, CD4 count under 50, and they tell you there's a white retina on exam, fully white, then I would think that you have C and B retinitis. This can also cause a retinal detachment. So somebody with AIDS presents with retinal detachment, I would think C and B retinitis. And with herpes simplex, the picture you see right here is probably something similar to what you'll see on the exam. You have this dendritic lesion on fluorescein staining. Uh, and usually this is due to reactivation because the initial infection usually just causes a blepharitis or you know inflammation of the eyelid itself. And, you know, there might be a exposure in the history like sunlight that triggered the reactivation. Uh, and give them acyclovir and one pearl is they say, do you give steroids or not? And you say not because steroids can make this worse. All right. 
and shingles. This is a, uh, you know, this is challenging to separate from herpes simplex, but in general, if they tell you there's a rash that extends beyond the eye itself, sort of the skin above or below the eye because it's in the cranial nerve V1 distribution, that should help you separate it. Also, this usually occurs in older immunocompromised patients. And if they tell you in the history there's a prodrome of symptoms, maybe a day or two before the pain developed, I would be inclined to think it's more herpes zoster. And know the treatment, which is different. You want to give acyclovir and topical steroids, which you would not get for herpes simplex. And I wanted to put this on here for you. Ramsey Hunt syndrome is when you have a zoster infection affecting the, the, the facial cranial nerve. And the key finding on exam would be the painful vesicular rash uh, extending out from the ear. And these patients typically have a Bell's palsy sort of presentation with paralysis of the, you know, the face, uh, you know, loss of the wrinkling of the forehead and loss of their nasal labial fold uh, in the face. So when you hear somebody who has what sounds like, you know, uh, gosh, I forgot what it's called, cranial nerve 7 palsy, you're thinking Lyme disease. This is an example of when it's not Lyme disease.